Hello, I'm uh, Sue Quick, a doctoral researcher at BIFOR, that's Berlin Institute of Forest Research, and I work at the Free Air Carbon Dioxide or FACE facility. Thank you for the opportunity to present my work. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the help I've had from my supervisors, my colleagues and the operations team. This work wouldn't have been completed without them. <clears throat> the Future Forest Base Experiment is a semi-natural old growth temperate oak forest. The treatments that we apply within that forest, um, there are three of them. So looking at the um, photograph here, you see a green patch of woodland, which is a semi-natural woodland with no towers and no treatment. The orange patch here is an example of the elevated carbon dioxide treatment and the blue patch in the background there is also controlled by towers but it is ambient carbon dioxide introduced into the forest. Today I will talk about oak tree water usage. My project is based at Bifor Face Forest and I'll explain how we measure an oak tree's water usage. That's historically, currently and hopefully predicting what might happen in the future. To explore the water usage of old growth temperate oak forest, we monitored trees in an open air elevated CO2 experiment. For five years. We found no significant changes in water usage or 34% increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. The stresses associated with this CO2 experiment may take long, longer to show their effect. Tree water usage depends both on species and on tree size stem size and the area of ground overhung by the tree's canopy and it's consistent across all treatments. Experimental infrastructure changes the water demand of the trees probably due to changes in microclimate and airflow. We've also confirmed that the environmental factors other than CO2 influence water usage on all these oaks. The historic context for these trees is illustrated in this slide. It all begins in 1843, just a little while before the germination of the oldest by four face oaks. Whilst we think the oak plantation at Norbury was intended to feed production of timber hold ships, as well as providing structural timber for grand houses. Things were changing. Brunel built the first iron hulled steam engine driven ocean going ship, the SS Great Britain, which was launched on the 19th of July 1843. By the 1950s, when the trees were mature, pollution levels from power stations and other industrial sources were still at their height, having peaked in the late 1920s. Present, we know that CO2 levels are still increasing in the atmosphere, even though our emissions have dropped. Coal fired power stations are being dismantled and replaced by a combination of other energy sources. And by the 2050s, offshore wind may provide most of our energy. David Lapola, a lead scientist at Amazon Face, our South American equivalent, as plants absorb carbon dioxide alongside with water and light to produce sugars and release oxygen. So what happens when one increases the input? We don't know. All forests store carbon and release oxygen, not just the large tropical forests. So the research is important in the global assessment of how the climate emergency 
will affect forests of the future. Historically, we've exploited forests for many purposes, including timber, food, shelter, clean water and fuel. Now we have another service to consider, carbon storage. Today, I'll focus on explaining how we obtained results concerning the effect of carbon dioxide on transpiration and water usage. I'll talk about the measurement methods and relate them to plant science. And finally, take a, an initial comparison of leaf level results compared with those obtained from stem sapling. So this diagram illustrates what we're going to do in my project. Uh, and which results we're looking at. The blue arrows represent flows of water through the trees in summer and in winter. Water comes into the transpiration stream from the soil. Once the root xylem is saturated, it waits here to be drawn up through the tree, driven by photosynthesis tomato regulation and the amount of transpiration. Here I've illustrated the amount of water in the soil by bucketfuls. So in winter the bucket's likely to be full in a deciduous forest as the trees have no leaves for photosynthesis and very little transpiration as a result. During a summer drought the bucket may be emptied gradually and Near the surface, it may be totally empty. But some species like oaks can bring water up from greater depths to sustain the rigidity of the soft tissues in the plant, for example, the leaves. And water fills the live cells, and this is called turgidity. With no water, the leaf is unable to photosynthesize. Roots, on the other hand, can grow when they have water as well as the correct amount of nutrients transported to them down through the phloem. So they keep growing in winter. So here we're looking at the structure of the tree in this diagram. Water flows upwards through the act active xylem, the sort of pipes, you might call them. And in oak, this active xylem or sapwood forms a ring. Beneath the bark, it's a bit like a cylinder. The central xylem cells, shown yellow here, no longer carry sap, sap up the stem. So this area is called the heartwood. And this species is said to be ring porous. In large oaks, water usage can't be measured as easily as in small plants. Uh, and in my project, I need to characterise how the oak forest is functioning to see how it's changing. In small plants, um, we can put the plant in a bucket, but we can't uproot the tree and put it in a large bucket to measure water usage. Instead we use electrical transducers and loggers as well as manual measurements to record data from a number of trees experiencing the three different experimental conditions. So in respect of the first item, phenology, that is spring and autumn uh, changes to the tree, we find that oak it's plastic, that is, it adapts and partially tracks the optimum of the seasons. But it is also prone to insect defoliation. If the insects eat all the leaves, it can reflush, so it has certain resilience. Sycamore, on the other hand, uh, another tree in our woods, and bluebells for that matter, they are rather less adaptable. They consistently have bud burst or flowering at a particular time of year. But the second item we're looking at here is how to measure sap flow or sap flux. Or 
um, again, it's not quite so easy as we said, putting it in a bucket. So here we use those electrical transducers with a heater probe presenting a pulse into the tree and then differential thermocouples measuring the result of the flow up the, up the tree stem. The third thing that we need to think about with these trees is how big are they? So we measure the circumference, which gives us the diameter and radius. Uh, we, we measure the canopy spread and its asymmetry and also the canopy height. Here's an oak tree with two sap flow probe sets installed, east and west. You can measure the total water travelling up the stem. And also here's a reminder of which part of the stem we're measuring, the sapwood ring. We know from laboratory experiments that a number of factors influence the transpiration stream to determine how wa much water a tree uses. So sunlight, air temperature and wind increase transpiration. However, humidity will reduce transpiration. These confounding factors need to be measured and considered, and that increases the difficulty of interpreting the results on our data. Now look at the sapwood history and why it's important. Sapwood bridges a number of years growth of the sapwood. So if you have a chance to look at a tree stump or an oak tree or another ring porous species such as ash, see the growth rings and maybe a lighter colour towards the outer part of the stem. And in a large tree greater than 100 years old, each of these rings will only be a couple of millimetres per year. We don't need to cut down our trees to measure their history. Instead, we, we take long, narrow radial cores such as these. And um, these are extracted from the stem. You may have heard of dendrochronology to enable us to date the germination date of the tree. Our expert, Noel, Neil Loder, the University of Swansea took incremental cores from trees outside of our experiment to date their oak lifetime. On the left here you also see other ways we can look at the tree to see if it's failing, to see if there are any voids in it. This is called tomography. To determine the amount of water travelling up the tree, we need to know the proportion of spaces there are in the woody tissue, as well as the woody tissue itself, and the proportion of one to the other. We can find this out from the cores, as well as dating. So rather than taking long cores, this one, we can take a short 10 centimetre core from the tree, and that gives us the whole of the active xylem. We also can take very short two or three millimetre, sorry, two or three centimetre cores. And uh, these give us some information about the current year's growths. Let's have a quick look at some of the results I'm getting from my experiments. This is daily tree water usage. I'm not expecting you to understand all of these graphical representations because presenting results is quite complex. However, these are box plots and the y-axis shows 
daily tree water usage across the months of the experiment. The colour coding is as before, with the orange showing the elevated carbon dioxide results. The top line is the raw results, if you like, calculated into tree water usage, with each month shown separately. That's over these three years of the experiment. See that daily tree water usage increases to about July each year and then decreases as we go towards senescence or autumn leaf dead. Well, we talked about the size of the tree and size is important, so we normalize those results by the size of the tree, by the tree radius, to see if we can make better comparisons between these results. And this bottom line shows those comparisons, which vary a little bit, but they're not quite as widespread as those on the top line. So let's take another look at presenting results. This one, this time it's a bit easier. I just got one point for each um, treatment type for each month. And you can see the change across the season a bit easier. You can also see the phenology stages, the early leaf after bud burst, the middle of the season when the leaves are green and going towards senescence on the right, the late period of the years. In the end, we can use statistics to do exact comparisons, but first we need to know the data trends. That is the shape of the responses within the tree. So far, these responses can only hint at trends, not determine exact predictions. A longer term, greater than 10 year experiment, we should be able to interpret these results more fully. So let's take a look at the leaf transpiration measurements. We have to go up into the canopy to get these measurements using a canopy axis system, and we use an instrument called a pyrometer to measure stomata conductance, as well as infrared thermometer. And uh, there are benefits to using a pyrometer compared to some of the chamber instruments which are more complicated. The pyrometer takes less time to take a measurement and it's lightweight. And we don't need the sophistication of the carbon measurements provided by the chamber instruments. So here are some of the results, some of the data across the middle of the day from 10 till about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You can see that stomata conductance tends to peak in the middle of the day. And this corresponds to what we're getting with the sap flux measurement. But we haven't done any direct comparison yet. We can calculate transpiration from these stomata conductance results uh, using relative humidity and leaf temperature. So what do we expect to see at Bifor Face and similar forests in the future? Can we predict how they will respond? We know that increased weather extremes, including drier winters, storms, wetter summers or long droughts mean prediction is difficult. But Data from this transpiration project can be used to model the responses, be used in climate and vegetation models. The take home message is that transpiration data collected from my project can help to predict if trees will be resilient under future climate trends. A tree's lifetime climate history affects its water use. So we can make predictions based on the growth of the tree and the xylem and the results we have already obtained. I'd like to thank you for listening to this session. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about my project.